Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. I'm Pooja, and I'll be your host for this webinar today on behalf of Ryan Kursist. Um, Steve from Alsa, who was originally going to be your host, unfortunately cannot join us today as he had to had, um, attend an emergency, um, but all good. So again, and welcome once again. Thanks for joining us. We have a fabulous panel today, and I would love to introduce them one by one, um, panel of speakers. So please welcome David Sofra. David is a partner in charge at KPMG with 17 years of learning from assisting many of Australia's largest listed national and multinational public companies in all faucets of um, workforce and payroll issues across all industries, locally and internationally. David is an experienced consulting leader and people can be one of the biggest costs to an organization. And David's focus is to bring innovative solutions to organizations looking to optimize the costs involved, efficiency in the processes, whilst reducing risk and ensuring compliance. David actively develops industry leading thought leadership. He's a published author and contributes to a range of industry publications and business forums on a national scale. He is passionate about life, um, experiences, communities, connections, and learning. And Gary's on a strong belief in authenticity, diversity, and an engaged workforce. David, welcome. Welcome to. Thanks for having me, Pooja. You're welcome. Uh, our second guest is Rohit Jen. Um, and Rohit is heading uh, APAC payroll function for CSL. He has over 15 years of HR and payroll experience working for health, telecommunication, pharmaceutical industries. He has exposure to global markets and has managed national and international teams whilst gaining great knowledge to different cultures, payroll, um, payroll projects, implications, mergers and acquisitions. Um, Roy strongly believes in simplifying the payroll processes and brings automations to the payroll world. Um, Rohit, welcome to the webinar today. Thanks for joining. Thank you for having me, Pooja. Looking forward to a great discussion. Same here. And our last guest today is Kevin Ferdinand. Uh, Kevin is a director at KPMG with a focus on workforce compliance and transformation. He brings over 12 years of experience in employment and payroll option space um, in Australia for domestic and global clients and has assisted many companies in the provision of risk-based payroll advisory services. Over 24 for months, um, he has assisted many organizations review their payroll function and operating models, assisting his clients diagnose historical compliance concerns and transform their payroll um, function to for the future. Specifically, he has worked with organizations to review the configuration of their payroll and time captures against complex requirements of Australian industrial relations landscape and assist them reconfigure and deploy new solutions. Kevin, welcome to the um, webinar and thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Pooja. Thanks for having me and I'm looking forward to the conversation. Great. Um, so let's let's begin. Um, um, look, so wage compliance, as we all know in Australia, has been a trending topic for over the last few years. Um, a greater spotlight shown towards uh, organizations to ensure that they are meeting their requirements to pay the employees their correct wages and increments. Um, so with that, um, you know, David, do you do you want to start with that? Do you want to expand on that and, and sort of share your thoughts on that? Well, th thanks, Pooja. Um, and I'm glad you refrained from using you know, the, the term wage theft because um, <laughs> I'm not going to speak on behalf of Rohit, but um, I can say with all the clients that, that Kevin and I have serviced, um, we've never seen actually an intent to underpay staff. And I don't think that has ever been the case. And I think in many cases, the use of the term wage theft tends to go a little bit too far. So I like how you refer to it as wage compliance. Now, there are definitely circumstances where organisations um, haven't had the policies um, and procedures in place all the systems set up correctly to record you know, time correctly or calculate payroll. And I think that's an interesting circumstance because there, there should be in our minimum obligations for organisations to record time of their staff accurately and pay them accurately. But in the cases that I've led, um, it really just hasn't been deliberate. Um, it has been more a case of just misinterpretation or misunderstanding or maybe a lack of knowledge and understanding of how these awards should be applied or these enterprise agreements should be applied. You know, and a lot of the times inadequate 
processes and reliance on old payroll legacy systems, which just haven't been updated. I mean, on the financial magnitude of wage compliance, um, you know, I mean, you just have to read the papers to understand the size of some of these underpayments. You know, given the variety of the different issues that end up causing a lot of these um, employee underpayments, that they are significant um, and they tend to go over a long period of time. You know, if we look at the headlines in the past 12 months, um, including in the retail sector especially, but as recently as Monday in, in the banking sector, they can get very large. Um, we've seen cases reported in the hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, and then when you combine that with the public scrutiny that comes along with having a matter like that brought to public attention, um, it's very difficult for organisations to recover quickly from that. So... So uh, I would say to your question, Pudra, about wage compliance, um, I, I think it, it needs to be front and centre of organisations because the, the effects of wage mismanagement are, are much broader than just merely the financial impact. I mean, you have the effect on an organisation's workforce, you know, your people, your most important asset, um, you know, the relationship between employees and employers. Um, there are a few more important issues than pay itself. Um, yeah, it's a legal bond, but more importantly, it's a cornerstone of trust. Um, um, and employees expect that it's done correctly and it's done on time. Um, where it goes wrong, um, it goes beyond the professional realm and it gets very, very personal for the employee and the workforce. It can be extremely explosive. And when you add unions involved, it's, it becomes even worse. Um, this leads to a complete breakdown in trust. Um, Kevin and I have both seen that this then impacts retention of staff and overall your engagement of your staff, which at the moment we're battling with pandemic and other issues. But um, when this tends to happen, you, you, the engagement of your people is affected. I mean, obviously, the ability to attract people to your business in the future is also impacted. And we've seen that across a lot of industries. Um, I'd say the second um, impact of wage compliance is, is an organization's reputation and culture. I mean, before COVID-19 dominated headlines, you know, we saw some of Australia's biggest companies in the headlines for all the wrong reasons. Um, allegations of wage theft have been levied against trusted brands. And these allegations have tarnished brand reputations and consumers have and public scrutiny have weighed into the issue in one way or another. Um, different industries are affected in different ways, though. I'd say that for some industries, the financial repercussions are significant and it sort of stops there. In other industries, let's say hospitality and the restaurant industry, your reputation, your brand can be your li livelihood. So I think we've got to think about this from not just the financial um, impact, but we've also got to think of it from the non-financial perspectives. And lastly, let's not ignore the financial impact. Um, Obviously, the financial impact is material and can be material. Um, you've got the, the financial costs of the underpayments of wages itself, you know, including the recalculation of compounding missed entitlements, whether this is superannuation and leave entitlements. But also, you've got to remember, wage underpayments can go back decades and they need to be remediated over at least the past six years. There's also the interest, which is applicable on, on underpayments, which also can add up and be significant. There are the penalties levied by the regulators, such as the Fair Work Ombudsman, the Australian Taxation Office. And then there are the legal accounting advisor costs, so people like me, um, the cost of which can be also be significant. Why? Because wage remediation um, programs are lengthy, they're time consuming, they're complex, they're large data sets. Um, we need to recalculate. We need to obtain legal interpretations. And these consultant costs also need to be factored in on an ongoing basis because you're likely to be subject to annual audits if you've disclosed to the Fair Work Ombudsman also. So I'd say, Pooja, in a nutshell, um, that, that, that's my st uh, probably current landscape and state of play around wage compliance. Yeah, well said. Thanks, uh, thanks, David. So essentially, you um, the crux is you mentioned at the start of your conversation that it's not intentional by organisations you've come across. It's probably lack of um, education or lack of correct systems or lack of, um, you know, whatever. 
but it's usually not intentional. And those three pointers, as you explained, that's 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 quite um, quite clear. So thanks thanks for sharing your insight. So so just on that, David. So in the current system, it's very hard for organisations to have full confidence in their payroll and wage compliance. Um, why do you think that is? Uh, I, I would say it's it's multifaceted, Pooja. Um, I mean, why do underpayments occur? It, it, it's a it's a complex answer. Um, you know, obviously, Australian workplace laws are complex and difficult to navigate. That's no secret to anyone on this call. Um, you know, underpayments commonly arise because employees have been misclassified um, under an applicable modern award or enterprise agreement. Um, you know, how the employee works, particularly workforces which have high volumes of casual employees, are definitely risky and tend to lead to errors as their hours aren't fixed. So determining the hours um, that they work or at the times at which they work is difficult to accurately capture. And this, of course, dictates um, whether they should be entitled to additional pay, such as penalties, overtime allowances, etc. cetera. Um, so definitely, if you don't have um, systems in play, uh, which um, sort of reduce your reliance on manual outcomes, um, definitely that's difficult. I mean, if there is an underpayment, there are penalties under the Fair Work Act for breach of the Act. So if you fail to pay your employees in accordance with a modern award or an enterprise agreement, or otherwise fail to give them entitle, entitlements under the Fair Work Act, there are penalties for breaching that. Um, so, you know, I, I would say a mixture of misinterpretation and, and that sort of reliance on legacy systems is definitely a reason. Also, Obviously, the regulators, so the Fair Work Ombudsman and the employee himself, employee themselves, their awareness has, has shifted a lot. So they're, they're, they're well and truly understanding of entitlements uh, and there's a focus on that, which I, I think is sort of bringing a lot of these issues to a head. Sure. Sure. Well, thanks for sharing that, David. And 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 Rohit, I would love to sort of um, take the conversation to you and uh, drawing on, on on what David just shared. So, what would you say are the most possible reasons for payroll non-compliance in Australia? Thanks, Pooja. So, I think there are quite a lot of reasons. I'm I'm happy to touch base on some of them. You know, so the main ones, for example, is you know your lack of knowledge about your EBAs, your awards, and the local legislation. Right. So it is critical that your SMEs have absolute great knowledge about those because that's how you design your system. So from designing the system, I guess the second step is once you know the compliance requirements, your EBA requirements, it is critically important to design the system correctly. Because if your information is misunderstood, uh, then probably that's where, you know, the error could occur as well. So incorrect master data setup, you know, sometimes employees being set up in the systems for a long time and probably no one has had an opportunity to look into it. So that's where things could go wrong. Uh, failure to capture the correct hours, you know, so that is another critical one because these days we are highly relying on to our uh, timesheet solutions. So obviously it is critical that employees understand how to capture the hours, how to record the hours. And it is equally important that our managers also review those hours before they actually approve. So I think there is definitely going to be a little bit effort uh, required from the organizations to train up their uh, employees and managers on that side. Uh, not having the dedicated compliance resources, right? So that is equally because we all have payroll operations team. And obviously their focus is, you know, to get the payroll out of the way. And they're so... Uh, you know, attaining to that piece that probably we haven't allowed them sufficient time to stay up to date uh, with the local legislative. I think we're going to find some times to do that as well. Uh, receptive, right? So sometimes we do reactive actions rather than proactive. So when we find a problem, that's when we try to go and, you know, find a solution. Whereas, you know, if we try to be proactive, you know, we do a waste type compliance, you know, we do whether our waste types are behaving correctly, whether they are accruing super taxation penalties, I think it could, you know, save us for a long time as well. Look, I strongly believe uh, in five Ps, you know, the proper planning prevents poor performance. So if we take accountability, you know, I guess, you know, it can definitely help you for a longer time and it could mitigate some of those risks uh, from compliance perspective. Great, and love those uh, five Bs, very handy there. Just to add quickly on what Robert was saying, I think that the planning is really important and that upfront planning is very important, but I think it's that maintenance throughout 
uh, the life cycle. So we've seen a lot of organisations do a great job initially when they do implement a new system. But then how do, what, what structures do they have placed in place within their business to maintain that compliance as, as time moves, as the instruments move and um, keeping that at the forefront of your mind. I think that that maintenance is, is key and, and maybe sometimes in the past, given that these are such big projects to actually implement a payroll system, you get a bit of implementation fatigue and then you forget about it and you forget to that maintenance piece. So I think focusing on that maintenance um, as well, um, need, yeah, it just needs to be at the forefront of your mind. Absolutely. Um, thanks for sharing that, Kevin. Um, just quickly um, around the pandemic. So David, do you think the pandemic has introduced more complexities, making it even more difficult? Yeah, absolutely, Pooja. Um, what we're seeing with COVID is a real change in the way we work. And that such a change is probably likely to be permanent change moving forward. I mean, I couldn't see things changing so dramatically. So, I mean, what that means is when we talk about employees working more flexibly, it means that, you know, times at which they're working is more flexible and the locations they're working is more flexible. Yeah, but the obvious downside for, you know, um, of that is that HR and pay payroll teams won't necessarily have the oversight. Um, so they won't necessarily know when the employees are working or what they're doing. So having that properly recorded will be key. Um, so I would say the potential for wage mismanagement is likely to be even more acute as a result of COVID and, you know, um, HR teams not having direct oversight over their employees all the time. Uh, so absolutely, uh, I'd say that you know, the change in the way in which we're working um, and the flexible approach to working is going to mean that employees have to be more vigilant um, about what their employees are doing and where they're doing it. Um, and there is, without a doubt, um, a heightened interest from the Fair Work Ombudsman and there's a heightened awareness of employees as to what they should be receiving as their basic entitlements as they come out of COVID. Um, so I would say the fundamental takeaway for HR and payroll professionals and senior management is to exercise due diligence coming out of COVID, knowing that this is the way that we're going to work going forward. I mean, ultimately, um, um, you know, we can't prevent these mistakes from occurring, but then, you know, we, there needs to be confidence in the systems put in place to capture that, that time, minimise that likelihood, and if it occurs, it can be picked up promptly. Absolutely. No. Well, so if just on the same question, around the same question, Rohit, um, how has CSL tackled the impact of pandemic on, on their workforce? Yeah, sure thing, Pooja. So I think CSL and its employees, I believe, you know, demonstrated great resilience, you know, when it comes to COVID, right? So uh, CSL already had the flexible working policies, but obviously with uh, COVID, it just speeded up, right? So office-based employees had to quickly, you know, get up to the speed and, you know, adopt the new ways of working. You know, obviously online uh, work, it all changed to the online sort of platform. From an operational perspective, though, we did come across quite a few challenges as well. For example, there was a group of employees uh, who were working the rotating roster, but due to the COVID bubbles, we had to bring their hours to a different day so that, you know, it, it justifies those requirements. So doing that, though, obviously, it, rare, it brought some complexities, how to pay those people and how to pay their penalties so that they are actually not worse off. So we had to manually intervene and to put some controls in place. Uh, to ensure employees are no worse off. But then there's another instance where some employees were not comfortable uh, to sign in and sign off from the clocks, uh, given the COVID risk. So CSL quickly had to, you know, bring this geopolitical uh, solution. So that enabled employees uh, how to log in uh, from their mobile phones. So that was another thing what we did. But again, look, I think we all got to accept uh, it has been a great challenge for a lot of employees, you know, so there are people who couldn't meet other people. There's less interaction to your colleagues, to your workmates, uh, to your family and friends. So, but our EHS, you know, really helped the way through. We had the dedicated team to help and support them. Uh, look, at a high level, CSL really did an amazing job. They supported the team. Uh, they provided the flexibility to all the team members. You know, you can start early, you can finish late. 
uh, you know, you can do a drop off and pickups, you know, school homing, you know, so I think everyone had to manage and juggle those sort of things. Uh, on top of that, look, CSL really looked after the team. They've also given some extra data for mental health and well-being, which was very well received. And, you know, the feedback was pretty positive from our uh, employees perspective, too. Great. So it sounds like CSL had a quick turnaround, although it would have been difficult, as you say. It sounds like it had a quick turnaround and 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 looking after the employees' well-being as well, which is which is Absolutely. great. So, yeah. Um, delving a little bit deeper, um, Kevin, who do you think is responsible ultimately for ensuring wage compliance? It's a good question, Pooja, and I think. Um, you, you need to approach it um, as a whole of organisation. So ultimately, wage compliance, the responsibility for it sits with the employer. So the employer is responsible for ensuring that um, they are paying their staff correctly. Um, and then there's also a, a slight onus on the employee as well uh, in, in the event that they feel like they are being um, they aren't getting paid as correctly, just to have that openness and. Um, uh, comfort uh, and trust in their employer to go to them and inform them and have open dialogue with them around um, making sure that their entitlements are, are, are paid as, as they should. When we look within the organisation, trying to work through who's physically responsible, I, I guess it's very easy to just point the finger at, at the payroll team and say, the payroll team, you're the one that's paying someone, you're the one that's responsible for ensuring wage compliance. So I think it's, it's, it's much broader than that. Um, we re really need to just take a step back and, and look at the the employee life cycle and, and how the employee is actually interacting uh, from hire to retire and, um, and and working through how they um, interact with you and interact with the systems to ensure that they're telling you what they're doing and so then you can effectively interpret uh, what they're doing and pay them correctly. So it's not just the payroll team, it's going to be the person that's setting the roster. Have they set a roster that's compliant? Uh, and it's not going to trigger any penalties that you might not think about. When the employee is onboarded, have we have we onboarded the person correctly? Have we classified them correctly? So from a HR perspective, have we done all that? How is that information stored in our HR system? Um, how, how is that data that's stored in our uh, um, HR system maintained? Uh, where does our IT team, how does the IT team facilitate the passing on of that information from one system to another? Uh, and, and prevent any breakdowns between that passing over of information. Because if there's a breakdown in, in that transfer, um, there's obviously going to be issues in, in people getting paid correctly. Um, you look at uh, how does an employee interact with um, with their timesheeting system? How do they tell you how many hours that they're working? Uh, so like Robert's example is a great one. And um, I, I hadn't even thought about that, um, changing the clocking from um, your, your traditional fingerprint scan to maybe um, maybe some, some other type of biometrics or even a um, geolocation based on your phone, just enabling people um, to tell you when they're working and when they're taking their breaks. I think providing them with the systems to do that and whoever's responsible for maintaining those systems obviously is also um, part of the whole wage co uh, compliance and, and responsible for maintaining that wage compliance as well. And then, um, yeah, the employees, how they're inputting their leave, how, how they're managing their leave and um, how, how are we educating uh, employees? What training are we playing, providing employees? What training are we providing to managers to, to enable them to, to approve timesheets correctly? I, I think it just comes back to it's a whole of organisation piece. It's not just one particular person who's responsible for wage compliance. You just got to look at um, getting everything to work um, together correctly as intended. Uh, and it's not just for your EBA employees, it's equally applicable for your salaried employees as well. Uh, and making sure that you're um, capturing the da data you need for them as well to make sure that their payments are compliant. Mm. And, and Kevin, if I can just add in there, so payroll is the tail end of the uh, mm -hmm. picture here. So obviously we are responsible you know, to pay people what the data comes through. But 15 years ago or 20 years ago, we were sitting and you know, punching the timesheets, you know, doing the word interpretation. But now there's a huge reliance on the systems, you know, mm -hmm. your HR master data, your timesheet solutions. So I think it is definitely a collaborative effort for a lot of organizations to make sure, you know, your systems and your teams work together. Like from payroll, it is very critical that we work very closely with a workplace relations team. You know, should you have any doubts, uh, your, your, your negotiation could be different, your interpretation could be different to us. So I think it is critical that, you know, we reach out to multiple uh, areas 
to ensure that we all are compliant. So I think it is everyone's responsibility, right? Yeah, great, great insight. So, so what I'm hearing you say is it's it's a mutual, it's more mutual in terms of accountability from payroll to HR to IT to even the employees themselves. So, and the systems and you know, how people are using the systems. Education is important. It's it's a it's amalgamation of everything. It's not just the payroll team or the payroll person um, sort of responsible in the end. So, um, that's that's great insight. So, and just to follow on on that. Um, so, what do you think is the role of um, government um, besides uh, making laws and and to ensure more and monitor compliance kevin yeah the, gov the government has a big role to play you know and i guess when we think of the government we think of two particular bodies in particular the, the tax the tax office and, and the fair work uh, um, ombudsman uh and then um, what their responsibility is to provide a framework um to employers and to employees to ensure that uh, employees are being paid correctly and providing um, those employees and employers a mechanism to, to go to for questions and support around uh, ensuring employees are paid correctly and for employees themselves, providing them with the mechanism to come forward and um, um, resolve a, an issue where they think that they haven't um, necessarily been paid correctly. We've seen the government bodies do great work in this space over the last uh, 24, 24 months. Um, I think earlier this week we saw um, the, the numbers released by FWO in terms of uh, wage underpayments. I think they've recouped uh, close to $150 million worth of wage underpayments um, over the last 24, uh, the last 12 months. Um, and that, that spanned across approximately 70,000 employees. Um, not all of this was action that was directed by FWO. I think close to $100 million of that was actually large employers um, coming forward uh, proactively um, because they've gone uh, away and done a review uh, with internally or externally through a consulting agency to, to um, have a look at their compliance and proactively uh, ensure that their uh, employees are being paid correctly. And then from a tax office perspective, um, obviously last year um, they provided uh, or the superannuation amnesty was available to employees. Uh, employers in, in coming forward and, and making their employees whole from a superannuation perspective. Um, that was also a very um, uh, successful regime in, in returning money that employees were uh, are due. I think it was close to $600 million worth of superannuation entitlements that were returned to employees um, through that through that initiative. Um, and uh, yeah, I think, yeah, so not only do they need to set the, the rules, but they also need to provide um, mechanisms for um, and support, I guess, to, to enable that compliance. Wow, those are some big numbers there. And are there any, tools, um, any other tools where um, various governments can use to influence organisations to do the right thing? Yeah, there's, there's there's plenty of tools that can um, they can provide and they, and they are providing. So if we if we look at the the tax office, um, they've They've moved towards single touch reporting. Uh, I'm sure everyone on this call is very familiar with single touch reporting. Um, essentially, it, it is real time reporting of, of your payroll to the tax, tax office. Um, and then come 1 January um, next year, the tax office are moving from the first version of that to, to the second version of that, where they're going to be capturing more granular information uh, to enable them to do more. Um, not necessarily to do more checks, but they will have more data that they can do some proactive checks on their side uh, to ensure that um, compliance is being met um, for for their for employees. And then on the um, the Fair Work Ombudsman side, uh, we saw last year's federal budget where there was ten million dollars put forward over the next four years around regulatory compliance tools. So uh, what we're hoping to, to see with that um, budget funding is where we might one day have a, a, a tool um, that is released by um, the Fair Work Ombudsman that might um, be a safe harbor tool of sorts that will assist um, uh, organizations um, interpret their agreements correctly and ensure that their employees are being paid um, correctly. And then we've seen a series of calculators issued by um, the various government agencies, including the state government around long service leave and, uh, and, and the various entitlements. So just making it easier for employees and employers to, to ensure pay has been made correctly. Mm. Great, yeah. thank you. Thank you for doing that. Um, just quickly, um, just wanted to sort of share that um, if, to the audience, if you have any questions,
to, you know, the questions in the chat box and we'll end to take them. So I'll present them to the panel. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Um, okay, so coming, coming to, um, all right, so given your background, Rohit, can you highlight a few pain points or challenges with regards to the biotechnology or healthcare industries when you're staying compliant? Yeah, sure thing, Pooja. So I think uh, there are multiple areas, you know, where there are pain points, but I, I'll just address the top three ones. So I think, you know, those three areas, I hope, you know, it will resonate well with uh, a lot of other organizations too. So the first one is obviously the complexity of your EPAs and your modern world. Some EBA clauses are hard to interpret. Your interpretation could be completely different to mine, and that is completely okay because obviously everyone thinks differently. Uh, so, but it is critical that those clauses are well understood and documented. I would even recommend, you know, when there is EBA negotiations happen, you know, your workplace relations unions, everyone is involved, a payroll representation needs to be there because that will eliminate any miscommunication. So if a payroll representation is there, they will understand what's been you know, agreed, what's been negotiated, and they will actually help uh, in providing the right requirements when it comes to a system build. So moving on to the system build. So that's the second area where I feel you know, there is a lot of challenges in different organizations and probably one of the key pain points as well. So if the requirements are not given correctly or not uh, understood correctly, it may lead to a incorrect configuration and repercussions could be very high and you know there is no guarantee that it will be detected anytime soon so it is very critical that you understand the requirements the build is there you know it is totally tested you know and move to production only after the appropriate level of approvals are given uh, so then let's say you know the, the first one is take you know your ebs you are pretty champion about your ebs you understand that clearly your system is built very correctly as well because you had the same people who had the same knowledge. Then it comes to the integration, third and the most pain point. So if everything is built correctly, but if your integration is not sending you the right data or sending the data uh, in a different way, or it is retrospective adjustments are not coming up, the new stars are missing, I guess you know it could create a lot of problem. That means it is manually payroll team have to intervene uh, and when we rely on the automations, you know, we should have confidence into our systems uh, that it is working correctly. Uh, that, that's the big thing, you know, because compliance would be better if less people touches the payroll system. So that's what my take is, you know, uh, if a system is driven, you know, your EBS are good and your configuration is good, I think you definitely uh, have the chance, better chances of being compliant because compliance is something at the forefront of our mind. Even when we do the integration checks and all that, we do have manual support checks before we execute the payroll to make sure the data has come through correctly. So a little bit of intervention there definitely helps there. Great, so nicely summarized. So EBA systems and then the integration, they all need to be uh, aligned and, and, and so, so thanks for sharing that, um, Rohit. And Kevin, what are the key indicators to ensure compliance, especially in today's evolving workplaces? Like, how would you monitor? Um, I, I think over the last 24 months, um, I, I've done a lot of vulnerability assessments with uh, various organisations that are coming in to do a, um initial review to, to speak to key stakeholders and understand um, what their payroll function looks like. Um, and from those vulnerability assessments, I think the, the key takeaway is there's no one size fits all. Um, every organization is, is slightly different to each other. There are some themes, I guess, per, per sector, but, but ultimately I think every, every organization is different. Everyone's, um, using different systems and, and they've configured their systems, uh, in different ways. Um, in terms of these indicators, I guess, some of the things that I've seen um, uh, that maybe point to uh, potential areas of risk for organizations. I think the first one that I like to see is, is ask about the documentation uh, and the governance around that documentation. So when when was um, when was the last time your payroll manuals have been updated? Um, what manual processes sit around your payroll system? Um, and um, who's responsible for maintaining those manual processes and ensuring that they happen um, every time and correctly every time. Um, when was the last time, and I think Robert touched on some of this, when was the last time your EBA rules were reviewed uh, and, and formally signed off? And um, 
those rules that are reviewed and signed off, how, how reflective are they to, uh, in comparison to the rules that are actually sitting within your system? Um, looking, looking through um, some of the cost pressures or, or some of the um, timing pressures that the pandemic has put on us, um, like increased trading hours, for example, like for, the, for instance, this Friday in Melbourne, retail's opening up, uh, Chatston and High Point are going to be open up up till midnight. Um, so midnight's not normally a, the time that you trade till uh, on a Friday. So um, what happens from 9 p.m. till midnight? Uh, is there any additional penalties that are going to trigger based on your instrument um, because of this increased trading hours for the people um, uh, on the floor? Uh, and does your time and attendance system actually cater for these rules because they normally don't apply? Uh, so it's just understanding the, the business forces. And then I think the, there's how do you manage your contingent workforce? Uh, what's the oper operating model that sits around your payroll function? Um, what, what variations are there to, to employment agreements from one employee to the next? And how are those variations captured and, and then automated through the system as well? Um, and then the other one that um, some people, and I, I think I touched on this before, and some people tend to forget, is your annualized salary employees. Just because um, you have a, a annualized salary and you're set on auto pay and you're not necessarily competing in the timesheet, um, what's to say that the underlying award that you're classified against, um, you, might be get, you might actually get paid more under that underlying award if you did record your time? So how are you managing this better off overall testing for annualized salary employees? Uh, and are you at all? So these are some of the indicators. In terms of how, how do you monitor it, I think um, it's just been proactive, having um, SMEs that are uh, across um, the various components, ha having people that you can go to if you do have any questions or um, you're uncertain and, and going to people if you are uncertain um, to make sure that um, you are paying everyone um, correctly. Great, and some great analogies there as well. So, um, this is more like a broad level question, but David, if some, someone were to start today, how can they embark on the path to compliance? How, how can they start? Where, can, where do they start? That's a good question. Is that from the audience, that one, Pooja? <laughs> yep. Yeah, it's, it, it's, it's like I, I, I'm a big proponent of investing in your HR and your people and your payroll, obviously. Um, I, I would think, I think it comes down to probably two things. Um, if I was to start t today and invest, um, which should at least be front and centre of everyone on this call, I think, I think the first um, aspect is that workplace relation, you know, laws um, and setting up your payroll is not merely a set and forget approach. Um, Rowit and Kevin both touched on that. I mean, organisations change, uh, but so do the workplace relation laws and so do awards. Um, so, so, and, and, and Rowit mentioned it before, so do the interpretation of these awards over time change. Um, and we saw that on Monday with the big announcement in the banking sector. Um, so, and as we know, rates change each year also, um, especially for many awards. So that set and forget mentality, it's, it's such a dangerous one. Um, and if we can drive that out of organisations, uh, that will take us a long way down the road in terms of being able to get better compliance for payroll. So I'd say the second one, uh, would be around record keeping. Kevin spoke about record keeping, keeping good records when your employees have worked, how many hours have they worked, can you access that information for the core statutory requirements, can you go back four years, can you go back five years to find out what hours a particular employee worked and when. You know, can, can you see when they've changed their roles for higher duties, you know, can you very quickly and adequately get that information? Um, you know, at hand and be able to support calculations and support the analysis that, that you've done. Um, so record keeping is key. Um, you know, do you know how your employees are working? And keeping good records is not just about ensuring that you have pay records in place, but do you have a way of actually ensuring that you know how many hours a week your employees are working? So we've come a long way from the days of the old clock on time clock that I think Rowett mentioned, but in some ways what 
what I'm seeing as an advisor, we haven't. And, you know, we need to have some kind of time and recording system in place so that we can demonstrate that this is how many hours these employees have worked and ensuring that they've be paid correctly. So I, I would say in a nutshell, they're my tips. So it's not a set and forget mentality in regards to wage compliance. Um, and people need to be focused that this is a, a continuous um, changing landscape and, and it should be looked treated that way. I'd say that would be it, Pooja, yeah. No, thanks, David. Thanks for sharing that. So we do have another audi um, audience question. Um, the question is, hi, all. Considering all discussed forum, what are the relevant industries in Australia doing to better equip payroll professionals as historically, and like Rohit alluded to, payroll personnel would be ordinarily processing pays? So I think, Rohit, do you want to... Oh. You, you go ahead, Robert, and, and I mean, I, I'd quickly to say is nothing's been sure. done in my opinion. Um, if you're an accountant, you've got various professional bodies regulating the, the, the practice, uh, providing support training. I just don't see it um, and I don't think enough's been done to equip payroll professionals to be able to comply. Um, there are some good organisations out there that I think um, 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 that can effectively provide minimal support, but you know, there are no, there's no certified training and licensing, which is, I find, is enough uh, for payroll professionals to go and seek that support um, and that, um, that, that strength of governance. I'm going to flick over to Rowan because he has to navigate yeah. this landscape. Thanks, David. So I, I think what I believe it is critically important that you have the right SMEs within your team, right? So obviously the people who've been there for so long, they would know majority of your EBAs and you know your awards. So it is uh, important that they take the time to review at some stages uh, that how the system is behaving. So there could be implementation recently be done. So once you do the implementation, obviously things do change. So another alternative is you know do the thorough testing at that stage before you move on to the production. That could you know eliminate some of those compliance sort of risks, but also I think there is a support as as you mentioned, David. I think there is no certification uh, to that sort of degree, but I guess you know you got different payroll sort of association where you can easily reach out and clarify any of your doubts. Like I, I won't be even shy to pick up a call and you know, call the ATO if the things are not clear. And also look, rely on your networking. You know, we all work in the same sort of industry. So do have the catch ups with them. If you feel there is something wrong or there is something which you're not sure, you know, don't be scared to have, you know, meetings scheduled with a similar sort of industry. Uh, and, you know, it's always good to bounce back uh, any ideas from each other too. So, and, but most importantly, I think as an organization, we got to allow some time to our payroll people or a dedicated you know, compliance resources to ensure they have the time to adjust uh, and understand the latest legislation so that they can actually you know, put that into the payroll processing. Because if they're gonna continue to do the payroll processing and we don't allow that time to build that knowledge uh, as, in, as people, they are the most important asset our employees, so then probably we won't get much luck. So I think we have to put a conscious effort as an organization to allow our team members to reflect to what they have been doing and what else can they contribute. Look, I want, so you gotta mentor them as well, you know, nurture them to say, okay, is there anything you can find out in the system? Because they process the payroll, they would definitely know where there are glitches, where there are areas of the process improvements too. Uh, but look, I think, you know, just reach out to the networks as well. I think that that's a great help. Or if you're not sure at all, then, you know, one of the big fours, could always help uh, putting that perspective too. Sure, thanks, thanks, Rohit. So we have another audience question um, that goes: How often would you recommend reviewing your system for compliance? Who, uh, any, anyone who would like to take that up? Question. Uh, I, I might jump in. Yeah, if I don't, um, I, sure, I, I think there's no set set time in terms of how often you should. Uh, review your system for compliance. We've seen um, in the past, like we mentioned on, people have just set and forget and have not looked to touch the um, the review of their system for a long period of time. And obviously that hasn't worked and that's got us to the position that we are at today. We've seen now as we, as we move forward, uh, organisations are starting to do more of the continuous monitoring. So doing um, 
in, in payroll um, audits, essentially. So as the payroll is running, uh, having another program that runs over the top of the payroll to ensure that the, um, there's an audit over the payroll itself to, to highlight risk areas. Um, and, and more, more and more payroll systems or, or um, complementary products are sitting over the top to, to ensure that's happening. Um, also, as your, as your instruments change or um, uh, as you're getting new rates that you need to implement um, per your instrument, um, that might be a good time to not only update the rates, but review um, the other elements that are sitting within the system, doing an a entire wage code review. Um, to see has there been any legislative changes over the last 12 months, for instance, uh, and uh, have, have I been across those um, changes? And then um, the main thing is um, being aware of those changes, so um, subscribing to, to the publications that you can, so the payroll professional subscribing to what you can so that you're triggered around um, particular changes that you need to consider. Uh, and as you, as you consider those, um, um, make the necessary changes to the system and then look holistically at the other codes as well and see if there was um, anything else that you might have potentially missed. Mm. So just to add on that, Kevin, so CSL has gone through the complete wage type review last year. Uh, so once we were in a comfortable position that, you know, we can rely on, on, on our system, on our wage types, and obviously given the confidence to the senior stakeholders that we are compliant, Another thing what we introduced that moving forward, any wage type or anything creation of the systems, it has to be managed by the control change. So it's not as simple that, you know, just move that into production. So anything comes through, we created a template which needs to be reviewed by workplace team. Payroll team needs to understand that, you know, and then obviously we thoroughly test it and then we share the results before we actually move to production. So I think, you know, once you're comfortable with it, I think do put those change controls in place. Uh, to make sure that in future, nothing can go wrong. Thanks. Thanks for adding that, Rohit. Um, so, Kevin, which models to consider um, in in-house, at-house, hybrid? How do you decide which model to pursue? I think um, in the past, when, when organisations have tried to, to tackle the do I in, in house, run an in house payroll or do I um, outsource it to a third party provider? It's typically been something that's driven by cost uh, and um, hasn't really been a strategic decision. I think um, from what we've seen, we've seen in house work well, we've seen um, outsourced per payroll work well, but the commonality uh, in those payrolls um, that do work well is that um, there is a strategic lens to, to why you're in housing or why you're um, outsourcing your payroll. Um, and if you are outsourcing, um, how are you using that um, freed up time to um, um, ensure that um, that you're making the most of those resources that you are freeing up? The other thing is where it's worked well in in-source or outsource is that um, there still needs to be some payroll presence within the organisation. An organisation that's completely tried to um, dilute, uh, dissolve their internal payroll team and um, just rely on the outsource provider. That's never going to work well. Um, there, there needs to be that presence within within the business. I think um, to ensure uh, there's accountability on on the outsource provider, uh, as well as uh, providing the outsource provider with um, the um, the knowledge of the business and um, the the pieces that they might not necessarily be able to see um, uh, from their systems. And then. Um, yeah, I, I guess in deciding your model, uh, I think just work through um, what's strategically best for me as an organisation. Um, and then how, how do I integrate, if we are going down the outsource provider, how do I integrate that outsource provider into to what we do internally? And um, how do we connect our systems um, up uh, efficiently so that the right information is flowing through, through to the outsource provider um, to, to ensure the, the right people are getting paid correctly? Great, great points there. Um, thanks, Kevin. So, Rohit, what, what what would you look for in a strategic partner or a vendor to ensure that wage compliance is being adhered to? Um, are your current systems fit for fit or applicable um, fit or applicable uh, for industrial instruments? Um, how would you evaluate this? Yeah, sure thing, Pooja. So that, that's a very interesting question because we have recently gone through uh, that process. The so CSL actually released the detailed RFI RFP process, which is 
your request for information and request for proposal. Uh, so our requirement was to have a strategic payroll partner, not the payroll vendor. So there is a difference between those two. So we always believe in, you know, their success depends on us and our success depends on theirs. Uh, so we wanted to ensure that our partner has the in-depth knowledge within the specific regions where CSL operates, uh, obviously from an Asia Pacific perspective, uh, that their systems are fit for a purpose. So we did look into those sort of areas where we felt, you know, we have unique requirements. Can the vendor cater to those requirements? Uh, we also asked them to demonstrate some of the quirky uh, clauses what we have, that how would they actually display onto the pay slips or whether they can actually cater to those requirements as well. We also probed them, how proactive are they when it comes to wage type compliance, right? Given it's the theme at the moment. So we wanted to make sure, you know, how do they stay ahead uh, of the game and, you know, already understanding what the new legislations are coming, you know, how do they keep their clients active or updated onto those sort of changes? You know, what sort of audits do they actually perform, you know, to give the confidence to the businesses that we can, you know, rely on their system, their processes, their people, because I guess, you know, it is critical uh, for our senior management to have the full confidence into our, you know, payroll partner as well. So we looked at the longer term view when we chose our vendor. Uh, and look, obviously we are in the middle of implementation at the moment. So, so far it's all going well. And I think the second part you asked, you know, how do we make sure it is fit for the purpose? I guess, you know, I alluded earlier that, you know, look at your, um, it is critical for any organization, your vendor, your partner, that we've gone through at least one thorough analysis of your EBAs, your awards, and, you know, the latest legislation changes. Look, unfortunately, there is no really a shortcut, you know, it is a long process, but I guess it is important for any organization to do that. And the sooner you do it, the better it is, uh, because obviously if the time goes by and you find anomalies from the previous years, it will cause a lot more damage. And I think as David mentioned, you know, it's not only a reputational damage, but also, the, you know, breach of trust from the employee and, you know, lengthy negotiations as well. So it is, it is definitely important uh, to do that. So again, timely checks once you do everything, then probably once every year, you know, if you know, if you trust your system, then doing a compliance check shouldn't take you too long. So once a year is pretty good because, you know, within a year, how many changes can happen? You know, like two, four wage types, creation. So I think it's gonna be easy to stay on track if we do it thoroughly. Sure, sure. And I love how you said it summarized that you're not looking for a vendor, you're looking for a strategic partner. So that's that's quite um that summarizes quite well and you quite thorough with your with your um process, which is which is great. Um so in Kevin outsourced product uh BPO or full BPO, who is responsible for wage compliance? Um would it be the organization, the vendor? Um in in other words, how do we sort of for the lack of a better word, police the vendor. Um, Kevin, do you want to do you want to uh, share your thoughts on that? Yeah, if, if we if we look at the um, the the newspapers or the headlines that we've seen, I, I, I guess when you open up the newspaper, I'm yet to see an outsourced vendor be named in that newspaper. Uh, everyone that I've seen so far, it's been the the company's name that's been included in the article, and I think that points to who is responsible for wage compliance. So we um, so when you are embarking on that outsource model ultimately you are still responsible um i guess uh in terms of um policing it uh, i think um when you are setting up the the contract with your outsource provider it, it, it's very important that it's, you are clear on who's responsible for what tasks who's responsible for the maintenance of, of the rules and and responsible for some of the stuff that uh robert just pointing out like the wage top review who's responsible for maintaining that, who's who's going to be proactive on suggesting changes. So I think it's just working through with your outsource vendor, uh, vendor uh, and dividing up the roles and then um, working through those roles uh, in a strict manner to make sure that you are um, um, adhering to those roles within, within your agreement. Great, yeah. great. Thanks for sharing that. Um, we have a couple of audience questions. Um, I'll just quickly read out the first one that I see, Raj, Raj BHI. Um, how do you see automations in payroll systems helping compliance? Any specific example? So any, anyone wants to take that one? So I'll repeat the question. How do you see automations in payroll systems helping compliance? 
Look, I'm, I'm happy uh, to give it a go. And obviously, Kevin and David can pitch in as well. So I think from an automation perspective, you know, as I alluded earlier, the more we can trust a system, the better it is. So, you know, there are, so we have a vast population, you know, who do the time shifts, you know, the night shifts, morning shifts, afternoon shifts. So there's a lot of penalties and overtime involved. So if your timesheet solution is properly tested, you understand the requirements, it's totally tested before we move into the production, uh, I think you can rely on the system from that perspective. Whereas if your timesheet solution couldn't cater to that, that means you're relying on to the manual intervention and the manual calculations. And again, not that your, your team is not experienced, but again, there is always a risk when someone does this manually, we're touching the system manually, it could definitely go wrong. Look, not everything could be automated. You know, we still need, you know, human touch from time to time as well. Uh, but if we can focus on, you know, automating as many things, look, just give you an example. In one of my uh, previous organization, we actually automated the redundancy calculations, right? So uh, when we do manual redundancy calculations, yes, it is complex. Uh, yes, we do have the right people with the knowledge. However, when there is a large number, you know, you can make a mistake, but we try to automate the system that, you know, as long as the system is tested properly and you can confidently say, yes, it is working, it does save you plenty of time. Yeah, I mean, what, what, what thanks, I've thanks seen... Thanks for answering that question, Rohit. No problems. Sorry. We've got time, Pooja, Sorry. for my comment or... Yeah, yeah, you can you just we can we can quickly, but if you add um, your comments, if you liked it. No, you you, you go ahead, Pooja. That's okay. Okay, no problem. Um, so look, uh, we we are almost on time. So I would love to sort of first of all thank each and every one of you. Um, Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks to the audience and thanks for the wonderful questions. I think I personally learned a thing or two. Um, you know, thanks for joining us and for taking time to participate in this important discussion on wage clients. I trust you enjoyed the session as much as I did and took away some great insights shared by our panel. Um, special thanks once again to our panel, David Sofra, Rohit Jain and Kevin Ferdinand for a brilliant session today. I wish everyone a great rest of the day. So go to stay in Melbourne and I hope wherever you are, you stay safe and enjoy your day. Take care. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you.